Hello everybody and welcome to this latest interview. I have here a bastion of the detailing industry, namely Dom Kolbeck, who is founder of uh, Dodo Juice, of uh, Waxstock, and of various other things. And I just wanted to spend half an hour or so chatting to Dom uh, about various topics. Well, first of all, you can't call me a bastion. Why not? That's well out of order. Is it? You should, yeah, potty mouth. The other <laughs> thing is, there were other people involved with both the setting up of Dodo Juice and of of Waxstock. So we have to give them their fair share. Indeed. I'm just not a one man commercial detailing entrepreneur. There are also other people involved with these things, but I am proud to be associated both with Waxstock and with Dodo Juice. Brilliant. And unfortunately, PJ at the moment, the other half of Dodo Juice, uh, is away in America. Which you were saying was you were on holiday? Um, uh, no, it's a holiday for him, a holiday for us. I'm <laughs> sure he'd be the first person to agree. But it's, it's PJ's working. Mm -hmm. He's going out to the States to see uh, one of our main distributors and retailers, uh, Palm Beach uh, Motoring uh, Group, who go under the name of AutoGeek.net. So oh, wow. if we've got anybody here who is American that's watching, this at the moment, then yeah. AutoGeek.net is one of our main. They're bringing on Dodo Juice. So. Well, they well they've they, they've had Dodo Juice for pretty much ten years, a decade. Ever wow. since we started, those guys have really championed the Dodo. Yeah. So we're very grateful for them. And PJ pops out occasionally to top up on his uh, American accent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he also teases the alligators. Oh, okay. We did have some footage of him uh, of teasing the alligators, going up to them. On the golf course, uh, yeah. which is obviously um, for some kind of business meeting. I'm I was sure. about to say, he's not actually a golfer, is he? Uh, uh, he? He may play, but I think it was mainly because he wanted to see the alligators oh, okay. in I between the that. business meetings on the golf course. And uh, yeah, I don't know who was more frightened, the alligator or PJ, to be honest. <laughs> but if anything goes wrong, um, we'll get some kind of um, maybe a belt, maybe some um, nice uh, shoes. I don't know whether they'll be made from a PJ, PJ or, or alligator. Or an alligator. <laughs> but we'll get some kind of skin back that we can turn into something. <laughs> so, over and above sort of hunting wild animals, um, what I wanted to talk about really are, are the two main things we talked about: it's dodo juice and wax stock. But first, I just want to know a little bit more about Dom. I mean, we've known each other, and I, I want to sort of make it quite clear that when when I started PVD back in 2012, it was Dom whose hand sort of double piece came out and said hey why don't you come to wax stop why don't you do this why don't you do that loads of great ideas loads of support and to be honest we wouldn't be here I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for Dom and PJ's help over the years so we're very very appreciative um, but I want to know a little bit more about yourself because you have uh, all sorts of background in the automotive industry yeah I had some automotive marketing experience uh, I did a bit of work for Bentley for Vauxhall for Saab mm -hmm. um, uh, RIP kind of we have to cross our hearts a bit with Saab don't we they, they <laughs> tragic tragic <laughs> it probably might be my marketing that did it <laughs> so yeah you those, came up with the architect those, no no the, well that's pretty much the target audience I think but the, yeah. um, the, the Saab 9.3 convertible mm -hmm. I did a bit of work on that um, beautiful cerulean blue very nice blue mm -hmm. if anybody's got cerulean blue uh, uh, 9.3 convertible um, yeah despite beautiful advertising materials that I helped to be part of. Saab is no more, but I worked for, uh, with Mercedes-Benz as well, mm -hmm. with Bentley, and the opportunity came. There was a, a merger at work, and it was one of those, uh, I suppose, crossroads in life mm -hmm. where you can either have a new beginning at work with a new company, and it was a bit like in the office or whatever with David Brent where there's a merger and it's, it's like them and us. And, uh, so uh, it's never the most stable of times in your life. And I suppose it's when, if you want to do something, now is the time to, to do it. Yeah. So we're going through a merger at work and I decided to uh, leave to set up a, uh, a fledgling car wax brand mm. just because I was interested in car wax and wanted to make, and was starting to homebrew car wax, which of course is a lot more common now. There's homebrew forums on Detailing World. Yeah. But back uh, 15 years ago, there were no internet recipes for car wax. It was literally go and buy some materials. Well, remember, and you, you were actually making wax on your, your kitchen table. And in fact, your association with PJ, you knew PJ beforehand. Yeah. Was, he came along and took an interest in, in your yeah, P PJ was PJ was just a buddy of mine. And most people, when I was making the car wax at home, and I was just getting step back a little bit and and sort of not want to get. Well, that's it. I was making I was making car wax from uh, coconut oil, linseed oil, canuba, finest T1 canuba flakes, like a fine beeswax, and stirring it up, and learning about about car wax itself. Yeah. Literally from the, the ground up. And PJ was one of those people who most people I'd say, oh, I'm making a car wax, and they're going, oh, that's interesting. You come to the pub, and PJ was 
one of the few friends, uh, one of the few friends probably in general, but certainly one of the few <laughs> friends that was interested in what I was doing, who said, oh wow, you know, this is really cool, can I be involved, some, you know, can I try some on my car? So he was really interested and passionate about it. So that's how, um, so Peter was a mate and he became part of the company because he had skills in uh, graphic design yeah. and he had skills in IT. So it was natural for a company, this is starting, Dodger is 12 years old now, so we're going back over a decade. Back then it wasn't a case really of just getting a Shopify account and uh, buying some you know, car, car care materials in, putting them in a nice little bottle, getting a mate to do a label or whatever. Yeah. None of those resources really existed as they do today. Well, you're so, very much a pioneer in terms of in, in WAX, but also in terms of the, the marketing, the branding, and the way of going with it. And yeah. I wanted to touch more on that later on when we're talking about the Dodo Juice startup side, because that's a fascinating side to it too. Um, but so you started that and you started working with PJ and building these things in. And the thing is, you and PJ are both petrol heads to the core. Um, I know of some of your cars that you've had. So you, you had a Lotus Carlton at one point. Yes. So that's the super sexy 3.6 twin turbo Opel Omega, basically. Yes, that's right. Um, and did you have a left-hand drive one? Uh, yes, it was an Opel Omega. So it was the uh, the poor man's Lotus Carlton because mm -hmm. they were a couple of thousand pounds cheaper being uh, uh, left-hand drive. Yeah. And uh, I also had a, uh, a Porsche 964 RS, which if I wow. kept it today, um, would have been far richer than, than <laughs> I ever am now. <laughs> Um, it's uh, far more money than I have in the last uh, 10 years and through, you went through market a, forces. You went through a Lotus phase, did you, at some point? I had no, a Caterham phase, really. Caterham. So uh, I had a Porsche uh, 944. Um, I always vacillated. I had a Caterham. Yeah, and I got annoyed with the, uh, putting the uh, the hood up with the poppers. So yeah. I got a nine Porsche 944 convertible, which of course didn't have little poppery things for putting the roof on. And then I realised it was a bit of a hairdresser's car. Sorry to all Porsche 944 Cabriolet owners, <laughs> but it didn't handle like a Caterham. <laughs> wasn't very quick. Uh, quite a stylish car. Yeah, it's quite nice to have. You know, first Porsche or whatever. It was. Yeah. Uh, it was. A and is this the nineties or? Uh, I, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> it's the past. Yeah, it's going, it going past. back into. I was probably um, late twenties. Um, yeah, it's probably getting 20, 20, 20 odd years ago now. Yeah. Um, and then I, um, I got another Caterham. Yeah. Um, because I, I wanted the handling the performance back again. And uh, after that, um, I had a, I think a Porsche nine four turbo. Maybe I had that before the Caterham. I can't remember. But I was always between the Porsches, the Caterhams, uh, the Lotus Carlton, I thought I could have something which would be four seats and have, uh, you know, it's a good kind of compromise. Yeah. Uh, you'd be something sensible and also something that was a bit rabid and unhinged when you wanted it to be. But actually, the only thing that was rabid and unhinged was me after I, I tried running it and it kept breaking down. I think I probably spent more money, or as much money, running the Carlton as you did on your on your Audi S8, or still do on your Audi S8. <laughs> I, I, I spent the same amount of money again running it for 18 months. I can imagine. <laughs> Basically getting it up to tip-top condition. Um, but when I left the, uh, the advertising industry, I ended up setting up a, a Porsche servicing centre. So I had a few connections in that Porsche world. Uh, a great company uh, that uh, services and tunes Porsches and still still doing so today. Oh, brilliant. Um, and uh, that was my introduction really to business. So I went from being an employee to suddenly being somebody that was making car wax part time yeah. and was running a Porsche a Porsche service centre well, uh, without did, any prior did they experience. Give you better, better servicing prices than you had before. Well, the, but the irony is you couldn't take your own Porsche really to, to the garage because right. of course it would be the one that would be done last. <laughs> it would be the one yeah. that the technicians wouldn't really, you know, they'd give it a kick every time they go past because it was my car. So yeah. the irony is you know, I'd, I'd pretty much have needed to have booked it in myself as probably under a, a pseudonym if I wanted it to have the same care and attention that we were yes. giving to customers' cars. So yes, you'd think that it would always be the, you know, the, uh, the person uh, who's, uh, and, and I didn't own the company, I was running it for a friend of mine. Yeah. So I wasn't even the owner, so everything would have to be booked in. But it was interesting, it was a baptism of fire when it came to business, yeah. and it gave me, uh, don't reduce itself, I was making a few pots of car wax a night on a stove at home. That wasn't a business that could have sustained me. Mm -hmm. So eventually the wax side of things grew. Um, funnily enough, one of the guys in the, the ad agency that I was leaving 
was friends with uh, Tim from Clean Your Car. Oh. So he was setting up Clean Your Car around that time. So we had a mutual friend. So it's funny how how, how much of a small world it could be. Tim yeah. is obviously very successful with Clean Your Car. Yeah. And I was there setting up this little wax brand called Dodo Juice that no one had ever uh, no one had ever heard of. There were no hits on Google about Dodo Juice. And as you say, our approach with Dodo Juice was quite different. We wanted to create a brand that was fun and approachable and market stuff in a way where the car care products hadn't been marketed before. We weren't just going to be another serious, austere, me too car care brand. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't want to also be uh, a relatively exploitative boutique brand that was all about the packaging and very highly priced. Uh, we wanted to give people, if you like, boutique quality, small production quality mm -hmm. products, handmade waxes, made in small batches that were reasonably priced. So um, one of the reasons we're called Dodo Juice is that uh, some of the boutique waxes were very, very expensive, you know, thousands of pounds, uh, you know, laden with Canuba. Mm -hmm. And I was buying a Canuba in, I was getting the best Canuba I could buy. And it wasn't anywhere near those kind of prices that this finished product mm. would have been. Um, and I realised it was a big margin, it was a big markup, um, and a lot of that was in the packaging and uh, and perhaps the positioning of the product. And I thought, okay, there's, there's a lot of margin in here, but we don't need to charge that. We can yeah. make a good, honest living by charging a reasonable price for high quality products. So it was always to be, I suppose, a boutique quality product at a mainstream level price, or yeah. certainly an enthusiast level price. And I suppose what we did inject really was a lot of personality into Absolutely. the sector, yeah. Because we were well, who else at, at that time? We're talking what 2006, 2007. 2000, yes, yes, around um, that time. So I'm just trying to think to myself uh, who was out there. Obviously, we have the likes of Austin Maguire's and the kind of the ones that have been around for decades and yeah. Turtle Wax and all that. But actually, if you think of all the enthusiast waxes, so if you go onto a, a retailer's website now and look at all those brands, how many of those were a existent and b in this country? Yeah, and, and c in kind of popular well, culture. I suppose chemical guys were the the mm. people who were most similar in terms of their. Position. They were doing these specialist products at a reasonable price. They, they weren't crazy money. Mm -hmm. um, they gave people good choice with their shampoos. So um, I suppose it, they also had um, funny names or they had uh, a lighter hearted approach to the market. Mm. So I suppose chemical, but you had uh, people like uh, Victoria Wax, you don't hear much from Victoria no. Wax these days. And those guys were very, uh, in terms of actually making the, the products themselves, they had a very good ethos, but I suppose the marketing wasn't quite as um, left field as ours was. Um, you had people like uh, Bill Hammer, who's still with us today, yes. that were making, and Peter, uh, Pete Hammer's fantastic, you know, really lovely guy, makes some fantastic products, um, also in, in Essex, um, yeah. making his own stuff. Um, but uh, but Pete has always been, I suppose, relatively serious, <laughs> he makes some good quality <laughs> product. He probably doesn't need the, the, the kind of the marketing impact that, that we yeah. had, but we certainly injected uh, a, a, like this irreverent attitude to yeah, detailing. There was a lot of originality in it. Yeah, there was originality. It was a, what you'd call now, I suppose, a disruptor brand, a challenger yes. brand in the marketplace. And we're really just trying to upset the apple cart a little bit, trying to get noticed. But also, we were trying to do something genuinely different. We were trying to give some the market a good quality product that wasn't dumbed down for them, it, yeah. it was something that was at a high level. If they were a detailing enthusiast, they could appreciate it. And I think what I've learned over the years is a lot of the products that existed in the market were just what people had been buying. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that all of the manufacturers end up making more of the same product because that's what sells. Yes. So they, and they make more of it and they make it cheaper and then it sells even more and it, it's just all you ever buy is what. So unless you, you try and break the mold and do something different, people just buy the same, the same thing over and over yeah. again and then the manufacturers keep making the same thing over and over again and nothing different nothing gets changes. done at all. Nothing changes. And so. Well, what I was going to say is, is the, the name Dodo Juice, because one thing when we talked in the past, you were saying how uh, you have all these things, not just in car care, but in cosmetics and stuff like that. You look at the ingredients list and it's sort of, you know, um, lightly powdered unicorn horn and sort of all these things. And it was even less subtle. It made you sound like it was a real ingredient when actually such a That's thing That's it. Exist. And it goes on today a little bit with social media marketing. Uh, people can make all sorts of claims. And yeah. fundamentally, Car care is largely unregulated compared to, say, food and cosmetics. You can, uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, where you have to say what is in the products. 
you, there isn't as much disclosure. You have to have disclosure for uh, material safety data sheets, mm -hmm. MSDS, so you do have to have that. Um, there's all sorts of CAS numbers that go for exporting, and, mm -hmm. um, and people have to be aware of what they're using because some of these products can be very, very strong, very caustic, very acidic products. Um, but in general terms, what you put on there, as long as the MSDS is correct, you can pretty much say anything. Um, so the whole point of calling the company Dodo Juice was, look, you know, we, we get put extract of Dodo in here. Mm. Um, this is what gives oh, it more performance than another product. Um, and of course, that was ironic. You know, we weren't there. We weren't said, you know, because I, I, I thought you had a Dodo press where you usher the birds in and then just slowly crush them. The juices but, go down. But, and they, but, they, but this is it. it. People, I don't think people would have known. Um, what was happening is people were probably using more plausible sounding ingredients um, that, that could be made up. That were made up. Some of these ingredients are only existing on other manufacturers websites so yeah. they were kind of making up this uh, other titanium 32 or whatever yeah. is a, a compound and saying oh our product's got this in it's amazing and then um, a whole marketing campaign can be based on it people say oh I've got to have this other titanium mm. does, does yours contain this other titanium 32 well, it's an amazing you compound you still see it in, in things like shampoos and stuff and it says you know new x one z shampoo with with protein x sort of formulation in there yeah, it's and just uh, castor so, oil yeah exactly and yeah. there can be a little bit of truth sometimes in these products but some of it's just snake oil, it's marketing. Mm -hmm. And I realised some of that was going on, and I thought the easiest way for us to really take the Michael out of those people is to call ourselves Dojuice. You know, this is completely full of made up ingredients. Put it on, you can't see how shiny it is. People can't take seriously something that's meant to contain dodo extract or yeah. unicorn's horn or mermaid's tears or whatever. So it was us. Um, We've never played, for example, a Canuba percentage game. It's mm. just ludicrous. Well, you, you on uh, Detailing World, I seem to remember you didn't. You, it was uh, you, you put some truths out there in a post that still is existent today. Well, we were evangelical about it. Yeah. We still have it. Uh, we were a bit evangelical about Canuba percentages because Canuba is a good ingredient. It's a good natural wax. However, you could have a, uh, a synthetic wax today, which arguably gives more performance than Canuba, and yeah. it's a lot cheaper. However, Canuba became a big marketing buzzword um, ever since Mr. S. C. Johnson. <laughs> bought some back from the rainforests. Oh, was it? Right, um, yes. It, back in the, I think it was like the, the 30s or something that he he started using Canuba in furniture polishes. Um, yeah. was, beeswax was obviously Johnson's beeswax, very very yeah. famous. But he discovered this uh, Canuba palm wax. So um, and then the Canuba had taken off. It ended up with a a whole. Uh, it was really an identity of all of its own. You know, the more canuba, the more shine, the more yeah. protection. If this has got 39% uh, canuba, uh, I, I need to get another wax that's got 42% canuba. If that's got 42%, I need one that's 45%. If this one's got, and the whole thing, unfortunately, it was bandwagoning, a bit like turbo in the 80s. Yes. You could get a you could get a Hoover turbo. You could go and get a toaster that was a. Uh, Morphe Richards Turbo because yeah. it would do the toast even quicker. Everything and, and it didn't have a turbocharger yeah. in there. And, and, well, but and the irony is that having carnauba as, as a raw ingredient is a very hard, unpliable thing. You, you can't just get 100% carnauba and, and scrape right. it on it, a car. And it, it came down to the, the measurement. It was a buzzword, it was a marketing buzzword. So, but the marketing department were there saying, you know, hey, Canuba's fantastic. This is an amazing product. We've got to have more Canuba in our products. Give us a high, you know, go to the chemist. Give us a high Canuba yeah. product. And they're going, well, you know, we can get about 30 or 40 percent canuba in there realistically, and that's about it saturated, okay? That's about as much canuba as you can pretty much get into any paste wax that's pliable and spreadable. Um, but then you obviously can calculate percentages differently. Um, and I found a guy the other day that was using um, an R222 product, yeah. very nice product, but it says 100 percent canuba. And he was like, so this is 100% canuba. And I was like, well, look, no, the way that these things are covered. So 100% of the wax in there is carnauba, exactly. but not 100% of the wax is carnauba. It's, yeah. And also you have wet and dry weights and all sorts of things like that. So. Yeah, and you can measure by, by weight, measure by volume. So wet and dry, it's just a nonsense, really. The sad thing is that it just misleads people and it perpetuates the myth. It should actually be, how good is the product? Is it a good wax? How does it last? Do I like the look of it? Do I like the way that it applies? Is it a good wax? Is it a wax for me? Um, is it good value? Uh, it became a bit of a Canuba arms race. Well, it's like it's like in uh, nowadays with peak power in cars as well. You, you get to say, oh, it's got 400 horsepower, and you look at its power curve, and it's just one peak. So for, for four RPM, it makes that, and the rest of it, it's got nothing. And it, and again, it's because people are obsessed with it on paper rather than in the real world. Um, so the uh, the Canuba debate, well, I'm sure. Well, yeah, and, and I suppose the modern Canuba is the, the nano ceramic. Yeah, you know, we've got kind of like you know. 
9H most coatings. Ten, I'm, I'm going to bring out, I'll tell you what, Bert will bring out a 25 most hardness coating. Okay, it's just going to be amazing. So, you know, yeah, it's, how it's can one it be, of those things? You know, where's the certification? Is there an independent lab in Switzerland that's verifying all of these claims? Well, like for example, like SGS, for example, they do certain hardness testing and stuff like that, don't they? But then again, um, we, we're not going to get into a ceramic debate because we have so no, many. No, but it's more, sorry, no, sure, but the, the point is there's some genuinely good ceramic products, and these yeah. products are harder than the paint on your car um, but it's very easy for somebody to say have a standard product that might be what you'd class as a nano product but not as a ceramic product and the problem is nano and ceramic get bandied together yes so like say for something like our uh, future armor the don't reduce future armor spray cement we do is what you call you could argue you could absolutely chemically say that is a nano product because yes. it's particle science um, however it's not what i would class as a ceramic product for example whereas supernatural infinity in our range is a genuine yeah silicon right. dioxide style ceramic product um, however because they get banded together nano ceramic mm. ceramic nano people could easily mistake one for the other. You could potentially even get, say, some future armor and mistakenly yourself think that that was actually, say, like a nano ceramic when it's just a nano product. And it could be even sold online, perhaps by someone um, who's not very scrupulous as a ceramic product. But, and it might be a genuine mistake. Yeah. And videos get made day in, day out on all the social media sources. And it's a flashy video, an amazing looking car, and the beading, the sheeting is amazing. But there's never any um, uh, behind the scenes. Yeah. There's never really uh, the justification or the analysis. Um, and some of these products are going to be genuinely applied correctly and the genuine product and they do a fantastic job but it would be very easy you know, for somebody less scrupulous to do a video that looks identical. So one thing I wanted to ask is there's a kind of a weird parallel because when you came out back in 2006, 2007 um, it was about dispelling the myth of uh, fantasy ingredients in there and by going just head on in there and say yeah yeah okay so you've got whatever you've got but we've just squeezed dodo into this we've got the juice of a bird in here um, and now uh, with things have moved on and I was sitting there kind of mulling as I do about the branding of things and in the old days you were the new cool thing on the block well now you're the orthodox you're the establishment you are um, you know the, the kind of the foundation of the enthusiast detailing market and how and I wouldn't want this challenge but how do you remain um, young and cool and appealing to the latest brand in a much more saturated market um, with um, the kind of you know you've already got that reputation of being the established people and furthermore the people who don't like young wild things with lots of fancy colors and stuff are still going to be buying what they were buying in 1985 with the simple you know very square basic designs um, and what I really liked was how you were saying well back in those days we were trying to dispel the myths about fake ingredients now it's fake news and I thought oh here we go but actually it's very right if you look at Facebook videos if you look at uh, videos on other social networks Work platforms and stuff like that. Um, you see somebody of you know wiping a, a, a panel, putting something on there. We don't actually know what because you can't see it. Um, squirting water over it. It's beading. Perhaps if it's done by a pretty lady as well. So we say, oh, this product's amazing. I've got to have it in my Lamborghini. And you were saying, well, actually, you know, and, and the thing of beating beating paintwork with various. Yeah, it's not even necessarily uh, what I call specialist detailing companies that are doing those videos. No. It tends to be a an online social media marketing company yes. that could be selling. Um, magic dusters to yeah. housewives, so, and they decide to yeah. yeah, and they decide to to sell something to men to, to use on their car. So it'll be hitting the vehicle with all sorts of stuff, and then magically this product gets rid of all of the marks. And uh, yeah, it's it's basically crayon or whatever. It's yeah. not you know it's not hitting it with a chisel. Uh, all these marks that magically get removed could be magically removed with um, <laughs> you know. Well, no, they probably you might need something like lime You might need a you know a very yeah, basic polish. polish. Yeah. But there's be a basic polish that anybody watching this now has already got that would do the same job, if not better, than the one that's shown in that video. But the way the video makes it look is that you could pretty much drive it, you know, drive your car straight into, um, you know, another vehicle. Yes, um, have an accident with the tree and it's yeah, still Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, or oh, it wouldn't even be that. It would be that the, you, know, you could use this product afterwards. And it, it's a bit like, I suppose, the days of the, you know, the burning bonnets at the car shows where yes. people say, oh, look, you know, look how it protects the bonnet against the flames. It's like, well, pretty much, you know, you could set, you know, with the, that 
evaporation of the uh, the solvent you know, of the lighter fluid in your hand, you yes. can do that without it burning your hand. There's a real difference to is it going to stop you? <laughs> you know, you can't from you know is your car going to look as good if we get a flamethrower to it, or is yeah. it only going to survive this kind of one little bit of showmanship? So the problem is now that back when we started in the industry, there was a little bit of uh, insidious marketing going on regarding say canoeba percentages so we went in and we refused to quote canoeba percentages we explained to people we demonstrated canoeba percentages as far as we could we explained how and we said it's just about the wax just see how it goes on but you're not going to tie stuff because it's just meaningless you know pick a number one to 100 percent that would be how much canoeba is in there because we could just calculate it differently so it was a nonsense and we managed to turn that tide I think and yes it was ironic we were saying oh it's got dodo juice in there it was ironic we weren't there saying oh it really has got dodo juice in there you know we really do go to Mauritius some people did fall for it I remember back in the day well it was many American certain... American customs used to fall for it because they thought it was either foodstuffs or it was livestock and they thought that the dodo was still alive so but no any normal um, rational sane uh, intelligent person would know that we were joking when we say oh we put we shave the baby dodos to make our microfiber cloths. I shed a tear for that initially. Actually. Yeah, well, that's it. It was only it was only the gullible, it was only the susceptible that that were um, that were brought in. So we we were using it with irony. The difficulty now is that there is so much fake news, and it's so easy to do a video that purports to say something, but also people are ravenous. The online marketing and sales companies are so ravenous for sales mm. that they will pretty much say anything to get a sale, and they will claim whatever they want to claim. And it can be done. There'll be, whether it's something like a sofa sale ending on Sunday. Yeah. Okay, must end Sunday. Oh my God, I've got to go down there today because it's going to be, you know, it's kind of like the, the marketing myth. Yes. There's going to be another sale that starts the very next day. And it is, it's so um, trend driven. So for example, your, um, when it comes to pioneering products at the moment, everybody has, oh, what's this product? It's a quick detailer. What's that? It's a spray sealant. They put it in, into, into segments. And I've noticed with uh, Mafra, for example, and with yourselves, you've actually developed products like they have a carbonizer. You have your clay lube, ferro lube, isn't it? Which is a clay lubricant with fallout remover in. And we think, oh my God, you know, you've I got one or the other, it can't be both. Um, and actually, that's a really pioneering product that generally saves time when you're deconning your car. But because it's not in a specific category, I don't see it all over the place well naturally it's really clever and, and equally with you had a, a, a hose tidy so it's something you put on the car tires so that when you're washing the car and you're dragging the hose around it stops the hose going up against the car a really clever little piece of kit very simple um, but again although that's had a re kind of a rebirth fairly recently we featured it in the mag actually an issue or two ago um, that came out yonks ago and it still hasn't hit and so it's a matter of you're kind of still pioneering these products and trying to get them out there but because of all this fake news because of all this kind of you know we'll cure everything with one squirt sort of thing um, it's, it's proving quite a tough market, I would imagine. No, it's a very tough market. I think the truth is that innovation itself doesn't necessarily pay. Yeah. I think perceived innovation sells really well. And I think that's used as a marketing ploy Hence sometimes. Technology. So many of these products are high technology. And you sit there and think, what, what is it? I mean, I, I always get the feeling when I see a new product from Dodo, I think it's like the FSO Polymers. It's so ahead of its time that you're going to have to wait another sort of five or six years before people clock onto it. Yeah, and the sad fact is that people are buying what they've been conditioned to buy. Yeah. So it, it, even in the specialist market, which is more open, and the, the detailing guys are really aware, uh, they like to keep on top of the latest technology. However, it's very difficult for them to get truth even out of the manufacturers themselves. Some of these guys obviously aren't manufacturers, they're simply selling an existing technology, rebottling something that might have been used somewhere else. And unfortunately, to try and cut through the online marketing. Um, noise that you get these days, the claims have to almost be even more outrageous than the previous claims. Yeah. So we have come full circle in some respects because there has always been a degree of it, almost over-marketing in the, in the car care sector, uh, but now because of the internet and a whole lot of cynical, um, non-detailing specific companies, mm -hmm. basically just online marketing companies. Yes, they're just be product, selling, it's, a, it's a box shift, they don't know what's in there. Exactly, they could be yeah. selling kids toys, they could be selling um, hair straighteners, and then today they're selling something, it's a bit like you know QVC, uh, yeah. when they're selling stuff on QVC. And other it's shopping about, channels, obviously. And other shopping channels. Um, but the, the point is, there's a, a product that they're selling, um, you can demonstrate it. it, it works really well, and you get the sales flood, uh, flooding in. Now those guys are unnecessarily specialists. 
they might just be fantastic prevent, uh, presenters. Um, mm. it, you know, well, it for might be a, people on their sofa who are watching TV at three in the morning. Yeah, and, and if, yes, and yes, they're making that that um, that product available to the target market. And uh, sorry, that's what we call them—not not loaded <laughs> people on their sofa. Target market. So, uh, but the, the problem is those uh, those guys are very they're very slick yes. at selling. And it doesn't really matter what they're selling, as long as the presentation looks good, as long as the video looks good, and as long as the boxes start flying off the shelves, then they will, you know, that's what they're there to do. Yes. So what it means is that when that happens, not with the shopping channels, but basically the online selling videos, and they're selling, say for example, something that we would class as like a, a spray sealant product or a quick detailer, mm. it could be very easily taken up by one of those companies and made to appear far more impressive than it really is. And anybody on, say, Detailing World, you know, any PVD professional, whatever, would say, that's just a detailing spray. That, yeah. A detailing spray could do that. But yeah, this, is, street, he, this is yeah. sold as, I don't know, say, like a waterless wash. It's £20 for waterless wash. Oh, that's amazing. Some fantastic demos. Mm. So the, nothing, you know, legal is going on. They're demonstrating a product. But the way it's being sold is perhaps enhancing that product beyond its actual capabilities and where its stage is perhaps should be. So uh, the, the internet has allowed, I think, marketing to overtake the product. It's basically presentation, packaging has overtaken the product itself. People don't necessarily know a good product. They don't realize if a product is good or bad when they try it. They might not have the same experience of it. And it's really, a, I suppose, a case of if you're, if you're into wine, you might not know the difference between a, a fantastic wine and a really poor wine, but if it's in a beautiful bottle and it's kind of got a lovely label on it and it's been, it's got some good reviews on your, on, on you know your your mm. shopping uh, uh, website that you, you know if you go to uh, uh, some kind of online wine. Um, mm. uh, no, I, I know what you mean. I mean personally, I find the best the best wines are the ones in, in the box, and you just stab a straw in it and just starts. Like well, they get better. <laughs> but would you be? This is the point. Would you be upset? if you found out that somebody was getting one of those bags, putting it into an expensive looking bottle, and then putting a beautiful uh, wax seal on the top of it, and then saying, this is uh, Chateau Uel, okay? Mm. And Chateau Uel uh, 2019 is an amazing, and then you have a video, and you have all these people going around like some wine uh, show. Yes. Uh, tasting and spitting and yeah, doing uh, all the wine, wine tasting. Yeah. yeah, and and then you show you have shots of vineyards and you've got people going on and you see you see then this wonderful chateau in the distance and somebody's talking about Chateau Uel. They're going, mm. Oh this is Chateau Uel, you know. And it's like that, that's not Chateau Uel, that's kind of that, you know <laughs> that's, a that, that's, that's castle. castle Leeds or something, <laughs> you know, what's what's going on? But unfortunately that is how I think the um, online marketing has got carried away with itself to a degree because I think some of the, the common uh, standards um, of, uh, maybe there's an unwritten code in marketing mm -hmm. where, which stops at that level of cynicism. Um, you let people make their own conclusions, but you try and present the product in its best possible light, but you never make anything that would perhaps be an untrue claim. Mm. But I think there's a real a fine line these days between how products are marketed and what people believe about those products. And as I say, it doesn't even, it's not even necessarily, it's probably detailing products sometimes sold by non-detailing companies. Yes. So they're just e-commerce companies. Yeah, they've and they're quite big names. I mean, we, we've, we've seen somewhere, you've got these big names been around for years and years and years, and they're being, they've got a third party importer or something like that, and you see what else they import market and it's completely unrelated and I remember talking to again big brands about detailing and there was clearly no knowledge about it whatsoever. Yeah, it could be ironing board covers or whatever yeah. and they've got but they've got kind of 50,000 litres of detail or waterless wash or spray yeah. sealant or whatever and they'll do a video and it, all it does I think is it it takes away the probably from the process and the truth the product truth of detailing mm -hmm. because people are more confused they're just fed whitewashed uh, imagery of how it doesn't matter whether you spend one pound or you spend a thousand pounds pretty much that one pound product does the same job and there's no there's nothing really to uh, police it or to rein it in and i think people just need to be aware, like with fake news there's nothing to stop me going on now and saying oh somebody famous has died i'll just send that around share that oh i can't believe and it happens also people do it for uh, attention seeking or whatever and um it's because of the lack of regulation i think it just muddies the waters because uh, if people do know a good product, the only way they can really know if it's a good product is if they try it themselves. Mm. So, and it's 
it's such a mess in the market at the moment with so many people making so many claims with so many products I think people are genuinely confused and yeah going back to um, a, a question that you propose is what does uh, what are you going to do about what, it I mean this, is, this, this situation the, you, I mean as far as I see it is you can either play that same game and start becoming dodo juice and start creating a magic wax that lasts for two million years and is made mostly of dinosaur or um, you can carry on with what you're doing so we're honest we're doing this we're just building these products bit by bit and the danger then is you just fade into the background um, uh, what is option three what, what can you do to maintain a kind of a, a moral standard a self-respect standard as well as break into this market that is so fickle um, and full of, frankly, BS. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, we, we won't go down the, the marketing BS route. We I'm, won't. Not we, no, I'm not surprised. We, 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 well, the thing is, we've been, doing, we've been doing this for far too long. And mm. early on, when we realised some of the tricks of the trade, like, for example, we could uh, uh, dilute our shampoos a lot. We made them at yeah. their, the, at the, the concentration we thought everybody else was pretty much making. It was only when people said, how come this is <laughs> so <laughs> yes. expensive? We looked into it and we thought, well, it's because we're, we're giving you a proper yeah, concentrated yeah. product. Just to put that in context, an average car shampoo is about 250 to 1 that you buy in a store. Um, yeah, 250 to maybe to 400. Maybe 400. Um, on average. And then you bought out Born to be Mild. It was 800 as a starting point. Yeah. And then we went up, and of course, you could stretch out the product. We've tested it, I think, at 7,000 to 1, a supernatural mm. shampoo, 7,000 to 1. So if we wanted to claim 7,000 to 1, we can genuinely show the product foaming and working is it really working again it's kind of internet fake news we okay. can say we've got yeah. seven thousand to one shampoo but are we being genuine are we being honest are we being authentic so reality is we won't go down that route so it's a, ca a case really for us luckily we've got enough people that know what we do and we've been doing it for a long time i think they will start to there's so much uh uh over marketed yeah. online content now that i think there may be a little bit of a bounce back towards the products that are I think uh, right. staple products or established products which people feel confident with because it's easy to make that snap decision on that shopping channel mm. or whatever and press the bite now and uh, well, it's, 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 it's like decaf coffee I was promised that you know all these things by decaf coffee I, have one, I bought one tin of it and I'm never buying any of that again it doesn't do anything <laughs> it's completely pointless but I, I think in, in seriousness um, I remember working for you at Castle Coombe I remember um, one of your staff had had an accident with a curry or something and was feeling a little under the weather and you phoned up on, the, on like the Friday night, I said, Bert, can you be at Coombe tomorrow? We need to do some, some show stuff. And I was like, woo, this is fun. Uh, and um, so I went along and it was terrifying because there are all these products which I didn't know everything about, certainly not all the pricing about. Um, and it was just you you and me just there and there were lots of people. And the number of people, I'd done shows before in, in previous life and we would clear perhaps 500 pounds worth of product in, in, in a day on a good day and then the amount of people coming up it was constant of people who knew you who knew PJ knew Andy knew mm. these things knew the products and they, they weren't just sort of oh so what's this then oh tell me about that it was like right I need another of those and one of those and then another banana arm or whatever um, and you've got that kind of staple following there are some Facebook groups as well run you know internationally um, and that's another thing is that Dodo's got it you've got it you've kind of done the Dodo so to speak but on you in, in terms of the international side it's still it's a big deal in Europe and it's a big deal in all these different places which people don't appreciate um, I know in America it's a bit tough because they don't really get the kind of the sense of yeah the, the irony uh, is lost really on the, on the yeah, name but they'll come with evolution um, but <laughs> so with the um, <laughs> go to prison um, so I mean that's that's the angle of it though um, and that loyal following I'm hoping will you know we'll pull that through well what, what we're doing we're going to keep on doing what we're doing yeah okay in terms of innovation sadly stuff like Ferrolube where we integrated those two products Though we offered it, if you like, to the specialist market. We said, here you go, this is the product. And it doesn't sell as well yeah. as we sell masses of clay lube. Okay? Yeah. We sell tons and tons of clay lube. We sell tons and tons of iron remover as well, our Ferris yeah. Jeweler um, big fan fallout remover yeah. and, and wheel cleaner. People love those two products. Yet, the one that's in the middle. <laughs> the one that's in both of them. Don't take two bottles in the shower. Take, you know, take, don't take two bottles into the detailing bay. Take one. You know, that's Not the shower. That'd be weird. <laughs> that would be weird. Really Although stinks. you do smell a little bit like that. Oh, no. no, no, no. <laughs> but the, um, uh, there wasn't really a market. So the, I think the, the reality is that yeah. we're going to, in the future, to survive, if you like, and to compete with that market, is we're going to improve our, our packaging. Mm -hmm. Our packaging is going to be perhaps potentially um, you know, a little bit more at market. It'll have perhaps more of the product promise 
much shown on the, the packaging. Yeah. So I think we will improve our packaging. We will consolidate our range of products because yeah, we have huge. something like six shampoos or something crazy. Yeah, but and the they, total number of SKUs. I remember I came out a while ago and just said, how many different products do you do? And it was, it was yeah, three I, I don't know. We've got, we've got, yeah, we've got something like 250 SKUs, I think. There's, there's quite a lot of products. And some of those, obviously, you know, we would never dream of of dropping yeah. but we've got we do I think born to be mild in something like um, five or six sizes yeah. do we need five or six different bottles of born to be mild you know, we might need four of them but we probably don't need six yeah. and it'll be a case of things like Feraloop we know we've tried it we've got that product out there um, but people are kind of voting with their pockets a little bit yeah. and they're saying yeah it's an interesting invention it was worth trying but it hasn't caught on likewise with the you know things like the hose blockers and yeah. products like that um, I say we had them well, nut about plugs. eight. I love your nut plugs. <laughs> the nut plug again, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's a specialist tool. Um, doesn't sell in great numbers because most people don't necessarily. Well, need you to, have to have big brush. recessed nuts for it to make sense. But I use it yeah. the whole time on my rims. I know for anybody that that's trying, I th I'm sure. Bert's going to have links to the nut, nut plug before. <laughs> Is there a kind of... You're welcome to join, it's free. We just do a simple background check to yeah. make sure that you're interested. The, uh, yeah, the nut plug could easily be misheard and <laughs> take you off onto a different link altogether. But, uh, but yeah, that was a specialist um, wheel, nut and bolt cleaning tool. Mm -hmm. And we found, if you like, that the more specialist we go, then obviously the, the, the audience is far more limited. And so, we, and so commercially, we've got to be realistic and we don't want to be a mass market company that only does mass market products. However, I think people are telling us after 10 years, 12 years, this is what we want from you. Yeah. And they want high quality products, they want specialist products, but they don't want to be confused by them. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they don't necessarily need that level of uh, of choice in terms of having say six or seven shampoos it's more a case of look give me a good shampoo okay give me yep. a good shampoo that's that's got protection in and a good shampoo that's for maintenance without any protection yep. like a couple of shampoos would potentially be fun so i think we'll end up having um, a better, better looking range um, well, which will have a bit more appeal online um, yeah or, well, one online. thing i would say and, and actually Ian and myself were talking about this in the car mm -hmm. is that uh, quite a while ago now you bought out the supernatural which was your kind of taste the difference range yes. if you like um that said you've got you've got a fair few products in supernatural which you don't have echoed in the main range it's it's just more advanced stuff and it's a very kind of cursive stylish designer i don't know quite how i'd describe it but a kind of sexy parisian 1850 <laughs> kind of thing is what i'm thinking um and that Brand. I really like, I mean, I love the Dodo brand, but I, I love the Supernatural brand. I don't know, maybe that's yeah. something to... Well, those, uh, Supernatural, I think with Supernatural, uh, the idea of Supernatural was that it was, it was like the RS of the performance world. It didn't have any unnecessary fragrances, didn't have any um, unnecessary colorants added to any of the products, so that the active ingredients were there at the highest percentages. And what now, about the waiting list? Then? What's that? The waiting list, if you're going to call it the RS. Oh well, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the price tag, of course, is yeah. you know, it's more Sorry, focused. Porsche, Jack, know, it's, more, it's more focused yeah. RS than uh, you know, Porsche Nine <laughs> um, But we will have, uh, I think, the supernatural range. We will still have, yes. um, because it is a nice proposition. Um, in terms of obviously those active ingredients being uh, focused upon, because you take away the kind of you're talking only really a few percent in real real terms. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a small perform uh, performance advantage, um, but it's I think it's a it's a strong enough one for uh, you know the supernatural range to continue to to grow. And yeah. um, I think the uh, the other thing would be the positioning. I think we'll end up with say supernatural, uh, perhaps being more of a classic. A classic car range, for okay. example, um, and then I think Dodo Juice will be for you know the bottom enthusiast. So maybe that's how we will we will treat them, and then focus the products a little bit so that for older paints, for example, yeah. then they will be more catered for under Supernatural and for more modern paints. But I think we'll always have a mix. Dodo Juice will always be an enthusiast brand. Mm -hmm. It'll always be product focused. We'll always be telling people it's it's process more than products. It's not just some um, something you throw at a car. It's not. The irony is it's not this product that you just throw at the car or spray on the car from 50 feet away and you never have to wash your car again you know it doesn't contain the dodo juice and the mermaid's mm. tears that, that give you that effect you know it was ironic um, so we'll, we'll continue to do what we do but I think we'll do it in the perhaps uh, we'll have a bit more online content yes. we'll be out there a little bit more we will I think people might discover us for the first time part of the benefit might be that there'll be people online that will see some online content from us on Instagram or whatever and go who are these guys you know, yes. they must be new, and it's like, well, you know, it's kind of like the Rolling Stones or whatever. We're yeah. doing our, a tour 
and there'll be people that thought they've just started up, you know, a couple of years ago. Mm. So I think, you know, we'll, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, golden oldie is the, the right phrase, but I cer certainly think there are enough people that like like us. We've got a, a good customer base that we continue to build on, um, but we don't have that, I suppose, that explosive growth um, from some of the more fashionable brands mm. because uh, we want to be in the market in 10, 20, 30 years time with a dedicated customer base and I think the quality of the products and the formulations yeah. will eventually cut through because you can buy from a fashion brand once and then you go and say, oh, well, it's quite expensive and it didn't really do that much. But then you try ours and you go, okay, well, the packaging, you know, doesn't look as fancy or whatever, but the product was great. Mm. And we had, um, I had an email just today from a guy that was like, I tried your products and, you know, they really do work yeah. and they have, a, you know, and it was uh, a guy with a, uh, he had a, a Tesla Model 3, one of the first Tesla Model 3s, kind of very um, guy that's sparky. Yeah. <laughs> He's uh, kind of, you know, managed to get hold of one of those, I think, in the, in, in the USA. But yeah, hadn't hadn't tried anything before. I think he tried perhaps a lot of brands that promising the earth, mm. and, that, and that's the thing. In, you know, in, in the USA, hyperbole is the well, it's the it's the, the national um, language, really, isn't it? You know, <laughs> um, every, everything's fantastic. It's great. It's amazing. And the internet has exacerbated all of that. All of the marketing mm. is about how amazing, how wonderful, how fantastic the product is. To be fair, and the adverts where people say, look, it's mediocre, give it a go. Yeah, that's, it that's it. And yeah. you, you certainly can't do that. So I think we'll, we'll continue to do what, what, what we do. The range will be a little bit clearer. The proposition will be a little bit clearer. The products will, um, you'll still get the same specialist spread of products, but perhaps without the confusion. <laughs> we'll try and give choice, but not confusion, I think will be. Well, in the, future. the final thing I wanted to touch on, um, because again, this comes boils back to how you've been kind of contributing to the industry as a whole. We'll, we'll talk about Waxlock in, in, in a separate interview, but the um, final thing is your white labelling, so and also your Crankalicious brand. Um, but from a white label point of view, basically Dom has been for many years now offering assistance as Dodo Juice for people like wax brewers and that who want to build their own products and, and they don't necessarily know about health and safety, about all the marketing, all the labelling and all of that jazz, which Dom's very good at. So you've facilitated some quite well known brands now. Yeah, we don't we don't white label in the true in the true sense. You know, we're not a company that, yeah, sorry, that not, makes not, for <laughs> other people. Not white label in the commercial label. No, yeah. we, we we can't do that simply because we've been approached many, many times. We take your product uh, project on, for example, uh, Miltec wanted uh, an exhaust uh, polish, so we make Miltec's, cool. me Miltec's metal polish for the exhaust tips. I didn't know. That. And yeah. well, and you tested uh, yes. Motley Blue, it's a variation Motley of the Blue. same product. In, in Mega Test issue 8, uh, we did, and Motley Blue uh, was definitely, we, did, we basically came in the top, top three top finalists. Three. Yeah, out of probably, I don't know, what, 10 or 15 uh, or something. Yeah, we did quite a few, and I felt that Motley Blue was particularly strong on chrome, strange enough. And so I said uh, along the lines that if you have a classic car with lots of chrome on, Motley Blue would be the number one choice, but then if you've got a modern car with more stainless and stuff like that, we had a couple of other options on yeah. there, but it did really, really but it, well. But it's a cracking metal polish, so, yeah. uh, so we make that for, but generally speaking, we don't we don't white label yeah. in, in that true sense. We're not one of those um, uh, companies that, but partly because we're also, we're, we're just too busy doing our own thing yeah. uh, to do that. Um, however, we, we do help some of the home brewers. It's basically a home brewing label called Independent Wax Label. That's it. And Independent Wax Label was literally set up uh, to, help people, help home brewers get their products to market because they need MSDS and they can't test their, mm -hmm. their products and we can and they also need uh, a barcode and they can't supply their own barcode. It's not something you can just, you can create a barcode. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but they won't work. That number has to mean something. You can't just put in uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. and it looks pretty. It, it's actually registered. You need to be registered to have barcodes. So we can have something that is an official product. We can help market it. And uh, we've helped um, some amazing um, guys, uh, obviously the two that you know, most famous guys that we've helped literally from, again, their kitchen table effectively through to their own businesses now, yeah. uh, Jay at Bouncers and Dan at ODK. And so you'll know, or I imagine a lot of the guys who are watching this will know yeah. about ODK, they'll know about, and well, ODK um, we, was we, because, um, uh, I don't know if, I don't know how much Dan talks about his, his, about the name ODK, but ODK came about because Dan was doing it under his, maybe his detailing world name or whatever, mm. and I was like saying, oh, you need a catchier name. 
and your name's Dan, so why not be Obi Dan Kanubi because you're using Kanuba. Oh. So ODK was Obi Dan Kanubi, and that was the uh, that was his kind of like wax moniker. So that's yeah. ODK, and then of course um, Jay's got Bouncers. Mm. Bouncers is fantastic because he he started off and we rejected um, Jay's wax. He'll probably be the first person <laughs> to say yeah. you know he took a, a wax along to modify Nationals, I think it was, and we had a look at it, and I was like, it's just not up there. It's just not mm. good enough. And fair play to Jay, he came back within a couple of months, uh, not even a couple of weeks, with an improved recipe. And I was like, wow, okay, now we're talking. And that was yeah. Bouncers 22. And then we did Bouncers Satsuma Rock, and that was really giving our guys a hard time. I was like yeah. saying, look, this, <laughs> this guy is throwing this up. It's a really good wax. You know, and our, you know, our chemists have got decades of years of experience because mm. they've worked, obviously, chemical well, terms yeah, I'm, previously. I'm, I remember talking to Jay at Waxstock last year and he was saying how, you know, he's got these products all in the pipeline he's been developing, but some of them are literally for years um, to get them right. And, I mean, they're done and dusted as an example. Yeah, in fact, I mean, no, crack, that's a product. very Cracking, strong product. It's a fantastic product. And, and on the ODK side, we mega tested the ODK Concourse, which is a lovely sort of passion fruity smell. And it was a really nice wax. I like yeah. little nice boutique. Yeah, no, those guys have done fantastically well. And the lovely thing is that it, it gave, gave them a chance because you can either, in the industry, you can either, I suppose, embrace the competition to a certain degree, mm -hmm. um, or you can try and stamp it out. You know, yeah. the old way of doing it would have been to try and crush you know, well, we're not going to help you. You know, if you want to make your own product, you're not going to. But as far as we're concerned, there's more yeah. than enough business out there. Even if it's a really crazy and competitive market with brands being set yeah. up every every minute, if people are doing something different, like um, ODK, like Bouncers, um, Built Hamber, Angel Wax, all these guys doing their own recipes, mm -hmm. their own thing, it's great. Um, the only shame is when it's just effectively just the same shampoo that someone brings yeah. out, the different label, with a different Instagram account, and it's the next greatest thing and really it's not bringing the state of the art forward anymore mm. it's just the same old same old someone's claiming i've reinvented the wheel it's amazing yeah. have a look at my new wheel and you're going well we've, we've that's basically <laughs> the same them round things you know what they're called yeah. They're called wheels. yeah yeah exactly it looks like the same round thing that we've got over there we've yeah. had for the last 15 20 years what are you doing that's different you know different color different fragrance doesn't really help so um yeah we're still passionate about um, um about not only um, developing our own products um, but we're passionate about helping other people um, mm. to develop those. And in terms of those independent waxes, uh, we don't do you know we don't do that many independent waxes these mm. days. Um, home brewing is still fairly strong, but I think the um, obviously the market has moved a little bit towards sealants. Obviously, yeah. with dealer sealants, and sealants. It's a bit more hard so to, to home brew waxes. Those. People yeah. still, I think, for hand applying products, if you're an enthusiast. Waxes, you'll always come back to waxes, mm. really. I think that for the dealer seed industry, nano ceramics are fantastic. But for the for your average enthusiast who isn't a, a detailing professional, um, he's not doing cars for dealerships, it's not a brand new car, it's a daily driver that's a few years old, I think there'll be a resurgence towards waxes because they're so easy to use. You don't need the complication. It's a bit like with people like, I suppose when, you know, the, the Nespresso machines, you know, the yes. pod machines are kind of all kind of, you know, I've, I, I've got one of those and I went back to a caf cafetiere. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know what, yes, they're great because you can get a few more flavors and whatever, but I thought, cafetiere tastes really good. Yeah, yeah. So, no, well, I take the same with coffee as I do there. I just bang a straw on the top. And it's a bit crunchy, but <laughs> um, Anyway, Don, thank you very much for taking the time to talk oh, to pleasure. us. Um, we are going to be doing another interview shortly on wax stock and about all of that, because that's a different topic, an exciting one all the same. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, yeah, and uh, we will catch up soon. Thank you.